welcome. Uh, I'd like to ask you to please uh, also use the chat um, uh, and, and go ahead and introduce yourself there. Um, we're hoping to foster some relationships uh, as part of this introductory session. Um, so if you could pop your name in the chat and let us know, uh, you know, if you're representing an organization, your role there, and what brings you here uh, to this webinar sessions, um, and where you might enjoy making some connections around AB, uh, asset based community development and data practice. So my name is Melissa Moorhead, I prefer they them kin pro pronouns, and I'm here as co director of data across sectors for health, or dash, and I'm hoping to foster some connections between community leaders looking to learn more about asset based community development, and the role data can play in place based initiatives for community thriving. Um, I uh, going to take a moment to pop that information into the chat and we'll invite others to do the same uh, to give you an idea of the uh, types of folks who are on the call. Um, so uh, also in the chat, you will see once uh, they put their information in there, uh, Celestine Emberton, um, give, give a little wave her name. Uh, it will be important if you have any technical issues, please go ahead and you can uh, do a chat to the hosts or panelists or directly to Celestine. Um, so DASH is supported by the Robert J Johnson Foundation in uh, doing this uh, webinar work, the series, uh, and it has grown out of a couple of our own initiatives, one specifically around um, asset-based community development and the role that data can play uh, in that approach, and a different one that provided support for New Jersey hyperlocal data collaboratives. So we're offering this series of webinars uh, for ABCD um, and, uh, you know, this is the very first one um, in the the uh, webinar series will focus on the different specific activities and tools found in workbooks you can find on the Dash Connect website um, or, or we'll pop some links in the chat. Um, and in addition to these webinars that will have some discussion periods and interactive components to them. Uh, the ABCD coaches are going to be available for office hours uh, and coaching sessions. Um, we'll touch on that again before we leave, but I just mentioned the uh, New Jersey uh, component to this because if you are currently partnering with anyone in New Jersey, we will be prioritizing um, those coaching opportunities there, but everyone is welcome to apply um, for some of those office hours or additional coaching. So with that background on the overall program, I'd like to introduce you to the key faculty. Again, my colleague Celestine will manage the overall program. Um, she would be giving this particular introduction, except that uh, I can't support the technology as well as she can. So um, uh, but you'll be familiar with her uh, face to name over the course of the series. Um, you can learn a little bit more about the uh, ABCD faculty on the DePaul ABCD website, but in a nutshell, we are joined by Daryl answer. Uh, you won't need me to tell you that he was born and raised in London, England, because you'll hear that for yourself. But he's currently co-pastor of the New Community Church in Kansas City and founder of Verge Solutions. And he's served in a variety of leadership roles within churches, nonprofit organizations, and in community development. Indigo Bishop is also a faculty uh, on ABCD. She's a Clevelander, facilitator, and spe strategist specializing in sustainable development. Uh, she's worked in philanthropy and affordable housing, and today she's program officer at the St. Luke's Foundation. She has dedicated her career to building wealth and health in BIPOC communities and leveraging existing assets. Uh, so, and finally, uh, um, Ron Dwyer Voss may be familiar to some of you who are members of All In Data for Community Health, who got the chance to participate in a workshop at a national meeting. He's the owner and founder of Pacific Community Solutions, Inc., joining us from the far west coast. Um, that's a training, consulting, and technical assistance company focused on working with community-based initiatives, nonprofit organizations, and local governments, and focusing on asset-based community development and organizing, but also community engagement and mobilization and participatory evaluation, all for the purposes of sharing power in communities. 
So to help level set the on upcoming conversation, Celestine will post a poll to ask you to um, gauge your level of familiarity with the ABCD approach. Uh, and as you submit your response, Daryl will go ahead and dive in and get us started with ABCD. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, I believe Ron is going to guess. Yeah, and I had a poll pop up, but we're not ready for that. Um, all right. Can we show the, um, the slide? There we go. Um, so I just wanted to um, give a little bit of background about ABCD, and then um, Daryl will walk through a particular tool called asset mapping and um, which is sort of the foundational tool for this approach. Um, and then Indigo will introduce a bunch of other tools um, as well as a sort of overall look at the way um, ABCD looks at communities uh, as, as a setup for conversations about uh, where you all may want to dig deeper. Um, the origins of ABCD, uh, no, so go ahead and stay on that first slide, Celestine, for a second, um, are, um, the, the language came out of uh, the work John McKnight and Jody Kretzman did at Northwestern University, a bunch of research they did in communities around the United States, um, looking at uh, places where good things are happening and, and what led to that. The, and so that they sort of crafted a language around this that, that we still use um, that resonated with a lot of folks. The approach though is, is old, old approach anytime people have had to rely on themselves, or especially if they've had to rely on themselves because they've been excluded um, from uh, the power structures in their community or, or um, de marginalized from decision-making, um, this is an approach that the communities have tapped into. So I uh, want to recognize that it, it's a long-standing way of, of being and doing in community, um, but but this language we're going to talk about is language that's been pretty common in the United States since the, the 1990s. Um, so go ahead on the next slide, Celestine. Um, <clears throat> the first and foremost is an approach to how we engage in community. And one way to understand this approach is, is in contrast to um, a, a model that I, we're all familiar with, especially if you're anywhere in or near the health sector. Um, which is a services model. So if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see um, how services models were developed. Um, and you know many of them developed in the middle 20th century around, um, at the same time, medical models were, were being professionalized too, which was to focus on needs in a community um, and respond to problems. Um, the services model's sort of orientation is, is charitable. It, its emphasis is on agencies who then um, use resources, public resources or philanthropic resources uh, to help uh, people who have needs or problems. And, and in that sense, it's often focused on individuals and fixing individual problems by providing services. In that model, the, the power comes from the credentials um, which sort of align with, with the way the community is structured um, when the problems were created in the first place, um, which means that programs and, and people who are experts on, on programming are the answer. And it leaves uh, people um, who in the community participating in programs as either recipients or clients. And, and there's certainly a place for this, um, any of us who've had family members um, or neighbors, you know, with with severe health issues, um, have, have mental or physical, understand the, the value of some of this. If you've been around or been hungry before, you understand some of the value of this. And there's a place for it. Um, the difference with ABCD is that the challenge of the needs approach is, is that there's, um, it doesn't give you a lot to build from. It's it's filling holes. It's not building strength, um, and and it doesn't 
give you any ability to build power. And the asset-based approach is an approach that helps communities exercise the power they have, um, often latent and often untapped or unrecognized or underappreciated, um, so that they can change the circumstances which created the needs in the first place. Um, and so that's the approach we're gonna take here. We do that by focusing on what communities have, not on what they don't have, um, what's working, what's strong, um, looking at opportunities more than problems, investing in those for the long term. So these are usually long term building, um, sustainable types of approaches versus quick fixes to, to problems, which means we emphasize association more than agency um, in, in terms of the structure of how groups are put together. Um, and Daryl will talk more about the difference between association and institution, but we really emphasize association, meaning where people voluntarily come together because there's already some energy there and we can work with that. We can build on that, which means the focus is on community and empowerment. Um, and, and the empowerment piece is not on giving people power as much as it is recognizing where they might have some and working to facilitate them exercising that power. Um, which often comes from relationships where we connect the assets and Daryl will go into more of that. But at the end of the day, it, uh, the asset-based approach looks to the people in the community as the answer. Doesn't mean there's not some things that where we need some, some help from the outside, but we start with the inside and we build up from there. Um, and the reason in my 30 years of doing this work that I've seen that as important is because that's what can change the narrative. That's what can change the environment. Um, and, and that can change and help you focus on where you put needs resources, um, because a lot of times a community can, can build power and take care of itself well in many areas, which then lets you focus the needs-based resources in the areas where you actually want to focus them. Um, but the difference is the community has a role in that with asset-based approach because they have a say. Um, so next slide. So this is kind of how we see the world is through the, the, the big ring with associations, institutions are the assets that we've learned to, if we look through those lenses, we see what's strong in a community and Daryl will go more into that. Um, for those of you who like data and are interested in data like me, um, it's, uh, that runs all through this. Uh, data often describes what our assets are. Um, and is often available to help us understand where we can leverage things in the community. Um, and then information and systems changes all around it. So this is all about sort of changing the systems and the circumstances around the community from within the community working out versus from outside the community working in. And I'll turn it to Daryl, who will talk about the tool that we use to identify the assets of a community. All right, thank you, Ron. Um, and Ron, I appreciate you naming uh, this, the reality that though the language um, of asset-based community development came out of you know, John and Jody's work, uh, marginalized communities have practiced this approach and this method to survive <laughs> for, for a long time. So when we talk about, you know, we've been in spaces where we've asked people their ABCD origin story. I like to talk about my family um, that are originally from Jamaica and there was a practice that we had called partner, um, where we were pushed to the margins. Um, we, you know, financial institutions wouldn't loan to us. So what families would do is they would pull their resources together, and then those funds would circulate from household to household. And that's how you know we were able to pay bills and eat. And my mom is, uh, she's still a part of the you know giving circle in some places. That's what that's called. Um, so again, um, these are ways that communities on the margins have survived. Um, and this is a way for us to, you know, kind of put this in a system and more of a understandable way for organizations who are doing, you know, healing work, as I like to say, uh, in community. Um, so slide number, let me see, slide four. So let's need to move to the next slide. So in asset-based community development, um, we focus on the asset map 
as Run said, this is like our foundational tool that we use um, in the pursuit of building local power, creating um, change in the community level. And we don't begin with needs um, because the challenge with needs is you, you the, I love how Run said it, you fill holes, but you can't build anything <laughs> on needs. All right, there is, um, you know, in, in my community or, you know, I live in Kansas City, um, or any community where you find yourself, um, you know, there are needs assessments, there are needs maps, there are all these things done, and they're done for good reason, but the problem is the information that's gathered from these needs maps, folks who live in those places can't actually do anything with that information. Um, so, uh, I've been told the sound is low. Angela, I don't know. My laptop is having some issues. <laughs> um, so I, I apologize. Hopefully you can hear somewhat okay. Um, so I apologize for that. Oh, thank you, Erin. Okay, so Angela, maybe something on your end, I'm not sure. Um, so I'm gonna walk through really quickly um, these assets. Cause one thing we wanna mention is that we're doing, um, this is kind of like an introductory webinar um, and as we continue on this journey together in this series of webinars, we'll be able to go deeper into these workbooks um, that we've created. Um, so Celestine, if you can go to the next slide, number five. Um, so when we look at the asset map, um, and I love that it's a neighborhood asset map because in asset-based community development, we also wanna recognize that place is very important. Um, it's not just mapping assets of you know, a whole region or a whole city. Um, it is, it's very important for us to acknowledge what is, exists in specific places where people spend their time, okay? So we want to begin with associations and the associ associational life of any given community or place. So on slide number five, you can see examples of associations. Um, there are various associations that exist in neighborhoods. These are those uh, groups that are meeting that may or may not have um, a paid staff member, but for the most part, these are volunteers who are coming together based off a shared gift or a shared passion or a shared interest. Um, and uh, I would say, and many would say like, we are really struggling with building the so and sustaining associational life. Um, I'll get to it in a moment, but one of the things we see is um, we see many of our associations associations starting to function more like institutions um, and we're really we're really needing to revitalize the associational lives in our communities and I really believe our institutions that we'll get to in a moment can support that and help that um, but those of us who are living in communities working in communities the first asset that we need to discover and mobilize and help strengthen are those neighborhood associations not just like literal neighborhood associations, but again, using that example of those different types of groups that exist. And I'll just share a quick example. Um, I was able to help build a block club or a number of block clubs. I used to work for an organization where my role was around community health and wellness. So my role um, spanned a number of neighborhoods. Um, and there was no way that I could do my job by myself while serving all of those neighborhoods. So what I did was I started a, um, a coalition of uh, block connectors. So I would find people on blocks who are well connected. I would give them a stipend and they would do the work to build community on their block and build many associations on their blocks. Um, so that's one example. Um, of a block club um, and doing that from an asset-based perspective, not one from a deficit or needs-based perspective. Um, the next slide, uh, number six, uh, is institutions. These are for-profit, non-profit government entities. And like I mentioned, sometimes our institutions can find themselves, our associations can find themselves functioning as institutions, but institutions are still very important in our communities. Um, so these are our schools, colleges, police department, hospitals, social service agencies, various nonprofits, our neighborhoods, uh, the, these institutions exist. In ABCD, one of the things we say is institutions lead by stepping back. All right, so that's something we'll talk more about later on, but um, that's a very important asset 
um, and one that can help in bringing various resources into the community, but then also highlighting those resources that already exist in community. The next slide, is number seven, is uh, physical land. Um, so these are those vacant lots, parks, gardens, different places in the area, picnic areas. Um, where I live in Kansas City and where I've lived, I've lived in various neighborhoods in Kansas City. Every neighborhood I've lived in has had the issue of vacant land and vacant lots. Uh, many people view them as problem places because sometimes uh, it can be, you know, negative things can take place on those vacant lots. But one of the things I like to do is um, like, you know, reimagine if there are those vacant lots, uh, those places where there isn't life right now. How do you reimagine those places where it can be a place of community, um, where people can gather with one another? Um, so physical land, uh, a very important asset that exists in each of our neighborhoods. Uh, the next is exchange. Um, so this is, you can kind of call this a local economy. Um, there are various examples that are here on this slide. And one of the things that I have done in my community, um, this was maybe 10 years ago, uh, we did some work to build uh, this base of neighbors. We got to about 100 people. And what we decided to do was, we called it the East Side Resident Showcase, where we highlighted the entrepreneurial spirit of our neighborhood. Um, so we brought together our neighbors and folks who had side hustles. Um, and we took some time to start to build this local economy. Um, and even to this day, we still use one another for um, different um, business ideas and ventures that they have. You know, so our caterers, anything I do, I know I'm going to reach out to Mr. Toshiba to cater my meal, who lives a few blocks away from, from me, right? So again, as we think about these gifts, these assets that exist, when we talk about neighborhood maps, I guess the question that we have to wrestle with is how do we get as close to these communities so that we can even discover that these assets even exist? And then the, um, the asset of culture. Next slide. Um, culture, this is the, the stories that are told about the neighborhood or the community or the people. Uh, these are the stories that are told when the neighborhood was at its best, when residents rose up to confront a challenge. Um, so I love um, learning about stories of neighborhoods from people who have lived in community for many, many years. Um, so this is definitely an asset that exists in every single neighborhood. Um, and I remember I was with a neighborhood leader some years ago and uh, she was getting getting ready to start doing video recordings of the story of them beginning to organize in their neighborhood. And she made this powerful statement. She said, um, if we don't do this and capture our stories, our stories will be buried with us when we go. Right. So stories are powerful and stories are needed for the next generation to continue. Right. And culture is so important because it shapes really how the neighborhood exists, how it, how people inter interact with one another and the stories that they believe about themselves. And then finally, the last asset, uh, individuals. Uh, this is, um, as John and Jody would say, um, when they trained and even in the green book, uh, the individual is the most important um, asset. Um, when they did their research of all those neighborhoods, it was the individual and their gifts, right? So as you look on this uh, slide, you see some examples of gifts. Um, so in ABCD, one of the tools that we use is the gifts of the head, hand, and heart. Um, so the gift of the head um, is something that you enjoy learning, some interest that you have. A uh, gift of the hands is a skill that you've learned over time. And then the gift of uh, your heart is something that you're passionate about. Um, and this, over the weekend, um, I was able to do this with about 20 youth from my community. Um, for the last three years now, we've gathered youth and what we're doing with them is training them actually in this very simple tool. I've changed the language. 
a little bit. So it makes sense to like nine year olds, <laughs> um, nine to 18 year olds. Um, but I've been training them to go out and discover the gifts and do a, we call it a, a, an abundance map. All right. So same idea, asset mapping, um, but training youth to do the same similar thing. So um, they took some time this weekend to discover and interview one another, their own gifts and what are they passionate about, their gifts of the head, hands and heart. So again, these assets exist in every single community. Um, they are very important. And again, I know this may take some work for us because we've been trained. Um, if you're in the health sector, um, if you've discovered, you know, A, B, C, D, um, you know, later on in your career, there's a huge shift that has to take place. Um, so we're grateful that you're here with us. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Indigo, my colleague, who's going to put some questions out to you all and then walk through um, a couple more slides. Um, and then after that, we'll open it up for some Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, Daryl. All right. So we should be on slide 11, I think. And so this is just a, a, a visual representation of um, all those different types of foundational assets, the assets of individuals, assets of associations. And on this slide, it says assets of organizations. Sometimes it's um, we use the word institution. Sometimes it's organization, but uh, we mean the same thing. And so uh, this is a visual tool that's helpful for me to look at um, from the right side first. So it's a little counterintuitive um, for the English language to go right to left, but uh, looking at who the institutions are, who the associations are, and who the individuals are, but then um, going even deeper than that, even deeper than naming uh, the uh, John F. Kennedy High School, um, but actually thinking, what are the assets within that high school? So what are the, the, the teachers who are assets in that high school? Who, what are, what's the equipment that's an asset in that high school? Maybe it's school buses that they're willing to uh, let the community use for a community event. Um, maybe it's um, the cafeteria or the auditorium that they'll open up for um, for an initiative or for an event that is important to the neighbors. So there are uh, more specific assets within each of the, the, the names. Um, so it's naming them first, but then digging deeper into to, 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 excuse me, to determining what are the individual assets, the, the smaller assets inside the institutions and associations. Uh, so I have one example um, that hopefully is helpful. It's a healthcare example. I'm gonna drop uh, a link in the chat in case you wanna read more about it. Uh, but this is an example of organiz or several organizations partnering with an association and individuals to create a jobs pipeline in Cleveland. And so um, this was called Step Up to UH. Um, and it was really unique the way it came about because it was not top down, um, it was quite the opposite. So uh, there's an organization here called Neighborhood Connections. I used to work with them a long time ago. Um, they do really great work. They're one of the largest grassroots grant makers in the country. And so they give out $5,000 grants to groups of individuals in neighborhoods in, within Cleveland who have a project that they wanna do. And so they'd been giving these grants out for um, uh, several years. I think it was close to a decade. And they had all these leaders across the city doing great things, having um, reading clubs on their porches and teaching kids to read and having community gardens and block parties and um, all kinds of innovative solutions to the things that they were seeing as relevant in their neighborhood and needed um, and using the assets and uh, the people that they knew uh, to pull them off with a, a little additional help of some funding. And uh, so they had this network of leaders across the city, but who weren't connected to each other. They didn't know each other. So there was an example of one garden um, on one side of town that um, was closing down and they had a bunch of tools and resources, uh, but they didn't know that the, another garden across town um, on the other side was just starting up and could really use 
all those tools. Um, and so this was an opportunity for people to come together on a monthly basis and connect and share resources, um, not just individuals who live in those neighborhoods, but also institutional representatives. So people who work in the institutions in those neighborhoods have an opportunity uh, to bump up against folks who live in those neighborhoods and build relationships and share resources, which is really, really unique. Uh, so anyways, Neighborhood Connections hosted these network nights monthly in the same place at the same time every, every month um, where institutional folks and residents um, who belong to associations bring all their knowledge and resources and passions uh, to the same place together and have dinner, share a meal, and have conversations with each other on topics, uh, you know, on what matters to them most. And um, one of the things after doing this for years, um, Neighborhood Connections noticed that one of the conversations that kept coming up again and again was the fact that people who live in the neighborhoods um, where the institutions sit, um, like institutions like a hospital, for example, like University Hospital, um, the people who live in those neighborhoods were having a really, really hard time getting access to jobs at those institutions, which is not a, an uncommon thing, right? That happens in cities all over the country. Um, and so this was a struggle that the neighbors had named, the people who live in the neighborhoods named. Um, and it was also something that the people who work in the institutions in the HR department, um, who happened to be at these network nights, um, named also that they were frustrated um, that they were not able to hire as many people from the neighborhood as they would like. Um, they were kind of bombarded with thousands and thousands of applications every time they posted a job. And they recognized that the system that they had set up um, was not uh, was not working functioning well for the people who live in the neighborhoods who needed a, who could use a little extra support. So um, so the hospital step up or university hospitals, um, which sits in um, in the middle of university circles, surrounded by predominantly black neighborhoods, um, with very few um, employees from those neighborhoods decided that they would step out on a limb and try something a little different. Um, and so this is an example of the institution leading by stepping back. So they said, my dog is leaving the room. Uh, they said that they were willing to hold a set number of jobs um, that would become available entry-level jobs and that they would um, hold them specifically for um, people who live in the neighborhoods immediately surrounding the hospital. Um, so that they were willing to do that if, um, and because they were able to partner with other organizations, um, to help fill the gaps where, where they were not able to, um, to hire folks. So step or university hospital partnered with neighborhood connections because the hospital said, we don't have relationships in the community. We don't know the people who are here. We don't know how to reach them. Um, neighborhood Connections had been giving grants and building relationships and having conversations for years. So they knew it, they had the network. They, they knew the people. So Neighborhood Connections says we can access the people, um, but we don't have the capacity to, to train folks or to get them ready for these health career jobs, these entry level jobs. Um, and so another institutional partner came into the mix uh, called Towards Employment. It's a, a, a job uh, workforce development organization that specializes in training folks and getting people ready um, and uh, provided a career coach for, for each of the individuals. Long story short, um, this partnership between those organizations and the Neighbor Up Network, which is essentially an association of people coming together across the city um, to come up with innovative solutions together, um, together created this program where it was a, a two week unpaid training to get people prepared for these careers. And what they found was that um, they had an 80% retention rate of um, the applicants, so the, the folks from the neighborhoods who came through the program and, um, and learned and were supported and were coached. Um, they had an 80% retention rate, which was much, much higher than the hospital's average retention rate for folks who come from the exurbs and the suburbs and 
all the burbs um, who are coming into work. And this was um, initially one of the theories or one of the things that they were thinking was that uh, they would have a higher retention rate um, by hiring people who live close by, who are proximate. Um, and so this is just an example, a successful example of an institution partnering with associations and individuals, giving up a little of their power, doing something a little bit risky and testing it out. Um, and it really worked well. Uh, the administrators and the HR department were excited. They've hired uh, over 150 um, people from the neighborhoods at this point. And I'm not positive if the program is still going, but I, I hope it is. Um, what I've read is that they were interested in continuing the, the program and finding ways to integrate it into their normal process for hiring. Um, so it's one way that a small program or a small initiative um, can spark something larger um, and long lasting. And it was by identifying the assets and, and starting with what the conversations that the people on the ground are having. Um, so hopefully this is a helpful example. Um, follow the link to, to check out a little more details about uh, that work. And I am going to um, move us along to the next slide. All right, so, so asset mapping, I think you many of you might have heard of asset mapping or even done asset mapping before, um, but it's probably the most well-known tool um, from the asset-based community development practice. Um, so the um, we've talked about it a, a little bit, but the, the previous slide is essentially an example of asset mapping. Um, with more detail, it would be asset mapping. So um, these are potential tools that you can use and also tools that we would love to, to, um, to share more information about. And I think at some point we're gonna ask um, which of these six are most, which of these six are you most interested in learning more about? Because we can delve deeper into one or two or several of them over the series of this, this webinar, sorry. Um, someone's walking by and apparently that is unacceptable to my dog. So uh, asset mapping is one. It's really uh, the focus of, um, or the starting point, one of the starting points of, um, of working from a, a, an asset-based community development framework. Um, you can do them in many different ways. You can do them visually with a, a, a map of the neighborhood once you've defined the area that you're talking about. Um, the most important thing to remember when asset mapping is to do them with community and not for community. Um, so if you're alone in your office, I often say the, the only wrong way to do an asset map is alone in your office by yourself. Um, because if it's not an asset to the community, if the, the residents have not identified it as an asset, um, then I would argue that it's, it's not an asset for the community. And if you're not a part of the community, how would you know? Uh, what they identify as the assets. So anyways, asset mapping is one tool we could go more in detail to. Um, four questions uh, are another tool that uh, both institutions can use. You can frame those four questions um, as helpful for institutions to reflect on for themselves. Um, obviously, individuals within institutions reflecting on the question. Um, and then you can also shift the qu four questions to focus on um, residents of a neighborhood and what questions they might ask themselves um, to, to, to reflect and to push and to determine uh, how to use the assets, where the assets are, how to use them, and how to step up and use their power in a different way. Whereas the questions for institutions are about how to step back and be cognizant of their power and to, to um, give it up essentially um, in incremental ways um, and in appropriate ways and appropriate times. And we can talk about how to do that a little bit later. If you're interested in those four questions, um, we can share those as well. Um, 
trying to see if I have a couple examples. Some of the examples of a question that's framed from the perspective of a neighbor is, um, what can we achieve by using our own assets by ourselves? Like what can we accomplish by ourselves? Um, what can we accomplish with a little bit of help from the outside, from whether that's an institution or um, an association that they're connected to? And what can't, uh, what do we need significant support on? Um, uh, like what needs to be done by, outs by outsiders? Um, and splitting up, uh, the, like brainstorming what the solutions are and figuring out what's the priority and then asking these questions to determine who to partner with and how to get it done. Um, so those are um, the four, not those aren't the exact four questions, but that's an example of four questions and reflective process that can help um, in a community development project. Uh, and then power progression analysis is another tool that we could delve into um, later in the webinar if you all are interested. Um, I don't know if you've heard of a, a power progression ladder, um, uh, but, uh, but it's essentially a way to determine how best to support uh, residents uh, progressing in th their power. Um, and it, it's basically a tool that you can use to help identify where people are, whether it's um, you as an individual, if you live in the neighborhood, or if you're a part of an organization or institution working with neighbors, um, it's a tool that institutions can use to identify where people are in terms of their power progression. It goes from a uh, victim level, which sometimes people don't like that word victim. You can flip it and use, uh, use another word, um, but from folks who are feeling as if um, they are acted on and, um, and um, I'm trying to, how else to explain it. Um, people who feel as if they don't have power um, and uh, that they are left to the whim of institutions and, and the world and society um, to someone who um, feels that they have a little power and have a little bit of decision-making power um, that described as an advisor to moving up to a participant, a producer of, of solutions, all the way to a change advocate. Um, as the highest level. So identifying where people are and helping them get to that next level um, by, by essentially um, removing yourself as an institution from, um, from the process in appropriate ways. So we can talk more about that later, um, but that is essentially the resident power progression um, as a tool that you can use to um, identify next steps and, and to develop leadership in, in the neighborhoods and with the people you're working with. Or, or leadership within yourself. And so um, that's power progression. Learning conversations are really like a fundamental building block of, um, of asset-based community development because it's impossible to get to know, it's impossible to, to know what a person's assets are and individual's assets are without having a relationship with them. And so learning conversations are basically a way to um, uncover what people care about and what motivates people to act um, and to know what's most relevant for people uh, where they live and, um, and with what they do. So um, there's a whole process and specific questions that we have for how to do learning conversations. And, um, and we can, as I said before, dive more deeply into that in the future. If you're interested in learning that technique, I, I would highly suggest that we go into detail on that one because it is one of the first things you do before asset mapping. You have to build relationships. You have to talk to people. You have to have conversations and you have to know what people care about um, and you have to know what they consider assets. So um, learning conversations are super fundamental. If you are trained in community organizing, um, it might sound really familiar. It's similar to a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, um, and so, so that's something we could dive into more. Capacity inventories are a little bit similar. Um, they have a, a different series of questions um, that have more to do with, I'm trying to, here we go. 
that have more to do with um, identifying gifts and skills and talents um, and finding out, uh, for example, what what associations someone might belong to, how are they connected in the neighborhood, um, and who else do they know in the neighborhood who do similar things. Um, um, it's, a, it's a great tool to understand individuals and, and what they bring and the assets that they bring to the table. And then the last one listed here, um, house meetings, um, is similar uh, to the others in terms of how to use our our homes and our space as a as a convening um, opportunity um, to bring people together um, in 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 our homes um, and where where we are. Uh, I think I heard something somewhere. Uh, I don't know who said it, but it sticks with me often. Is that if someone's never been to like we say that we have good relationships. With, um, or that we're friends with someone or that we know someone well in community. Um, but if they've never been to your home, how, how much of a friend are they really? How close are you? And so bringing folks into your home or going into someone's home is a, is a very special um, and privileged thing uh, that does signify a different kind of relationship. Um, and so those are things we can go into more detail later. I want to make sure we have time for questions and answers um, today and um, and whatever you're sharing or whatever you're most interested in here will help us um, know how to really tailor the rest of the webinar series to uh, your particular interests. Thank you, Indigo. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is um, give you some time along with the questions that I've seen people starting to put in the chat. Um, we're going to open up so folks can raise their hands and ask questions. Before we get to that, I just wanted to give some opportunity for us to just reflect a little bit on our current context, the work that we're involved in. So there are two questions we just want to put in the chat just to give you a minute to think about and respond using the chat. Uh, the first question is, which assets or asset does your organization engage with most often? And then the second question is, where could your organization grow in implementing the ABCD approach? So those are the two questions. Just want to give us a moment to reflect a little bit, try and digest <laughs> for a moment uh, this information. Um, and then we'll jump to some Q&A after that. And please feel free to put your answers in the chat. Thank you, Jack. Alexandra, thank you for sharing. Is there a way for when you respond to respond um, to everyone? I believe it's just going to Jack and Alexandra. I believe your comments just came back to the panelists. Yeah, I can't tell if everybody's seen the questions or. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I believe that uh, attendees cannot um, message everyone, um, but thanks everyone for helping us uh, do the best we can with the platform that we have available at the moment um, and suggesting some ways that we can uh, um, maybe change this up a little bit in the future. But uh, 
go ahead and keep putting stuff uh, in the chat. We can see it and we'll start uh, addressing questions in just a moment. Um, there has been a question or two about the office hours or coaching opportunity. Um, hopefully my chats that say they go to everyone do go to everyone <laughs> since I'm a host or panelist. Uh, and as a reminder, we will be sending a, a post, um, uh, a, a webinar survey, I think it will come out something saying it could post webinar survey, please do uh, take a moment to respond to that, not just because uh, we'd like your feedback on this particular webinar, but that's where you'll have an opportunity um, to tell us a little bit more about what you might like to see in upcoming webinars and uh, your request for office hours and coaching opportunities, um, themes for that. So. Um, uh, do keep an eye out on that. And uh, you don't even have to be born in New Jersey, much less work there in order to qualify for this out opportunity. But if you do know someone, we'd be interested in hearing from them. Um, it's they, This is also an opportunity that's not limited to um, just the folks on this call. So feel free to invite your friends and neighbors uh, and other uh, uh, organizations to um, sign up for the webinar series as they come out and uh, we'll build a little community of practice as we go. So uh, Celestine, do you wanna take us into uh, the Q&A now that we're kind of pivoting on the fly of what we thought it would look like via chat? Um, I think we do have the ability to uh, read off some questions and even uh, unmute folks if they wanna respond, uh, use their voice. Yes, yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. And that is the end of the webinar portion. We are now going into the Q&A. Um, so if you could submit any questions that you have into the Q&A box, as opposed to the chat, it will e be easier for me and our panelists to keep track of. Um, also, if you would like to ask your question verbally, if you raise your hand, I can put you off mute so that you can speak. And yeah. So we'll start out with the first question, which is, um, how might one build ABCD into a CHA slash chip? So community health improvement plans. Um, <clears throat> I can take that one. I've seen a, a few groups um, use ABCD in the context of developing their community health improvement plans. Um, what I've, the tools I've seen used are the asset mapping so calling community folks together, community leaders usually, and by leaders meaning resident leaders, um, not just agency leaders, and doing asset mapping with them. And then um, following that with the four questions, you know, what could we do ourselves? And But what they do is they tweak those um, and talk about, you know, what could the community do with support of our health agency to improve well-being using these assets. Um, so they, it's, it's not a wide open, you know, what could we do with the asset map, but it, it does say, what could we do about community well-being with these assets? Which things can the community do itself that we can maybe provide some support, some resources, meeting rooms, whatever it is. And, and what would be helpful uh, if we, the public health agency led on um, and that's led to some great discussions um, in areas in, in Northern California. I saw that lead to um, a process where a number of Spanish speaking mothers who knew each other from an elementary school really took on a lot of mental health well being issues in their community um, because the process recognized that they had something to offer there, whereas they, before that process, had just they came to the meetings wondering why the health agency wasn't doing more about it. And so it, it shifted their perspective um, on, on their own agency. And then that became part of the community health improvement plan that uh, the women were leading. So that's one example there of, of how four questions and um, asset mapping were used. And I would just add Another question in addition to those is um, sometimes institutions need to ask or residents need to ask what should institutions stop doing? Yeah. Um, sometimes things are being done that um, hinder people from stepping into their own agency. So I just wanted to add that. 
Yeah, and a lot of times it's unintentional. You have people in institutions who are like, we'd love for the community to lead. And they don't really realize that even though like you might be a humble person, your title, your institution, your salary, all of those things pushes people out of the decision-making space whether you intended to or not. So part of this process is bringing people back into that space so they're in conversation with you about what we wanna do in the community. So there's a, in the chat, uh, Jack yeah. earlier on asked about, uh, a, asked a similar question and wondered if you could tie it to specific tools that might help a public health or, um, department create that community health improvement plan with community. The, well, the asset mapping tool and the four questions tools, as I described, do that. Um, I did work with a number of public health agencies um, where we had them um, talk about all the, the resources in the community that contributed to health, farmers markets, grandma's cooking, like it was just all over the place. And, um, and this was a mix of agency staff and residents. Um, and then we, we had them put that on a power ladder, which we just literally drew with blue tape on the floor. And then asked, what, what, what ended up happening was people realized that there's a lot of assets that could contribute to health and well being in the community where folks were low on the power ladder. And so those assets could be amplified by moving people you know, moving them up the power ladder by changing the way residents engage with them. Um, I didn't follow up with that, so I don't know how many of them implemented that, um, but it, it seemed to lead to a lot of ahas for folks. And one other, the, the tool that I'm most familiar with using um, that, that works for me, I, I don't know if it would work for a large institution, um, but as a, a one person or a group of people working to create an asset map, I use um, Google My Maps. Mm -hmm. In Google My Maps, you can create maps with layers um, of information. So you could identify all the schools and color code them one pin color, um, and then add in notes into the address of those schools. And I'll show you on the map where the schools are. You can add in notes with um, detailed information on the assets within the school, um, for example, and then you can color code all the block clubs in that area a different color and the individual people you know inside of those associations and what they care about most. Um, and you can identify uh, the physical assets in that area and with a different color pin. Um, and details of those assets and how, how to take advantage and use them. Um, and then in the asset mapping process, I once you lay everything out visually, it's easier to see how to connect the dots and who is proximate to who and who needs to be connected to what um, in order to move some of the work forward. Um, so anyways, long answer, but the, um, the tool that I use is Google My Maps. And, but also, um, depending on who you're asset mapping with, the tool that you want to use um, might vary. Um, so if you're working with a group of seniors um, who run a block club in the neighborhood or in the area where you're working, um, Google My Maps probably isn't the thing that's going to resonate with them or that they're going to latch on to um, because of potential technology barriers Maybe I'm being biased. Maybe they're very tech savvy seniors. That could be the case too. Um, but being aware of the group that you're working with and what they're comfortable using and finding a tool that works best for them. Um, so it might be a group that prefers a paper map and to be in person together and put actual pins on a physical map. Um, it could be a group that would prefer to use a Google Excel or um, an Excel spreadsheet um, to, to list out the different assets and details on them. Um, it, can, it can be flip chart papers on a, on a wall in a room where this one is for institutions, this one's for, you get the, the deal. But, um, but picking the, the tool that works best for that group is important. You know, I might be taking liberties uh, <laughs> to go deeper on this, but on the other hand, a lot of this, I wonder, um, We've had a couple follow-ups in the chat. When 
when thinking about doing this work, it, is there a difference? Well, you mentioned some of the different um, audiences and participants and some different approaches for that. Um, we did have a specific conversation about uh, engaging with community in this, um, partnering with community-based organizations versus attending local association meetings. Mm -hmm. and just continuing to weave in some considerations of audience in that um, I think would help um, deepen the conversation as well, because there's probably, well, you've given us many examples of differences um, when the community members are leading these types of conversations or when it might be a public health department that is trying to get something done. And then we also of course have hospitals who are trying to do uh, community needs assessments and improvement plans that might show up even differently. So um, uh, given that the we do have someone who um, appears to be more on the institutional side uh, of a community, um, are there some suggestions that you have um, more relevant to that, like engaging with community uh, as partners or, or where they are or um, in some other ways? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I think um, there are definitely challenges with um, trying, you know, if we look at time um, and the lack of time that we all feel that we have. Um, but one of the questions uh, in some of our trainings that we ask is um, where, where do people gather? in that particular place. Um, and then, you know, sometimes you can even add to that question, how much power do they have when they are there? Um, so I think um, trying to build partnerships, trying to be like, trying to figure out like, where are the, where are those places? And some, some of us who are really doing this at its most, most foundational levels, some of our communities, there aren't even those places, right? So then you gotta figure out how do we create those spaces for people to gather? Um, which takes some imagination and definitely some collaboration. Um, so each community is different, uh, but to Michelle's question, partnering with community-based organizations versus attending, wrestling with that due to staff capacity issues, that's a real challenge, um, yeah. especially when there are multiple meetings going on. Let's say, as you said, different groups are trying to convene. So how do we, and there's, there's challenges with this too, um, you know, like, the backbone organization and the collective, you know, impact, you know, cause you can even do that. And it's all from a deficit needs based approach. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can figure out how to put some of our energy into finding out and which is the power of an asset map, like who's doing what, where are people gathering, taking time to listen first um, before jumping into any project, um, I think would be, um, that's what I would encourage like I'm, I'm dealing with that right now with a group in my community. They want to collaborate on something, but they don't have staff capacity to do it. So we're kind of at this place right now where it's like, okay, how can we reimagine collaboration um, to make this thing really work to benefit our community? Mm -hmm. And one, one tool or one thing that I suggest um, in some of these trainings is um, to do some self-reflection um, or uh, a, a time audit, I call it a time audit. Um, mm -hmm. So looking through your calendar to identify how much time we're investing in building relationships with people who we're supposed to be serving. Um, and um, for folks who work within an institution in a neighborhood um, that's, for example, a hospital um, that's supposed to make the community healthier, um, having relationships with people in that community where you sit is critical, and I think oftentimes it can be easy to to feel as if it's a role for um, just somebody who does community engagement as their full time job. Um, when I would argue that it's everybody's job to know people who you're supposed to be serving um, and to spend time building those relationships, and it doesn't have to be um, like fifty percent of your 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 week. Um, it can be um, one hour a week that you spend. Um, going to lunch with somebody who you met at a community meeting who lives in the neighborhood who you'd like to, to learn more about. Um, uh, maybe Friday Friday lunches you, you spend with somebody who you met at a, at a community meeting um, or so, some way that, that works for you. Um, but finding time and, and um, prioritizing that 
as part of your job. Um, I, Indigo thinks that's critical. <laughs> but I, well, but yeah, I it, capacity. Yeah. Um, in the next sessions, if we have time to go more into learning conversations, um, I can show a diagram of a listening campaign and how a small team of four people can over six weeks um, and only looking at a couple hours a week can lead to um, 50 to 60 community residents deeply listened to and connected with. Um, and, th and that can be a game changer. I think also with associations, the value of going to them is that while you might have connected with one person, if you go to their association, now you connect to all their people. And the value of that is they already care about each other. So you don't have to do the whole like convince you to care, you know, work together. But if they decide to care about what you're working on, then then they're in as a group. Um, and that's the beauty. They don't have to like ask a supervisor or anything like that. They're they're in because they like to spend time together. Um, so it's it it once you, if, when you if you build a methodology of engaging with associations and individuals that will build on itself much like compound interest and and you will find yourself 9 12 months later with with expansive relationships in the community um, that will revitalize your work as well as um, energize the community mm -hmm. and one other point um, along those lines that I've forgot to say was that um, I, I like to think of the community engagement aspect of the work in terms of um, it's not politics, but an example of the opposite is, you know, when it's election season, um, the judges come knocking, you start to get flyers, you've never heard of them before, they've never come to a meeting before, but all of a sudden they pop up and want to talk to you and want something from you. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're not doing that when we're engaging in community, that we're not just showing up when we have a survey, that we're not just showing up when we need feedback. Um, we're showing up consistently because we want to build a relationship um, and that it's not a transactional thing. Because if you have an authentic relationship, by the time um, you have, uh, for example, a program flyer designed and you need some feedback on it from people who live in the neighborhood who you're trying to reach, um, you have five, 10, 20 people who you could reach out to and say, hey, can you take a look at this and let me know if it makes sense or if it's confusing or if it appeals to you and would make you want to come to this thing. Um, and then it's then it's a natural part of your relationship and an exchange rather than transactional. Um, the 60 visual now. Um, <laughs> I can, uh, I'd have to find it. Um, and no, I, I don't know if I can find it on this computer now, but I can send it to Melissa to send out. That'd be great. And um, Ron, you indicated that you wanted to answer the next question, I think, deepening the uh, inquiry into how to um and to, i think it might be a learning conversation uh, i don't know about that i was looking at stephanie's question um how do you get folks to see their own gift strengths assets expertise rather than looking elsewhere i think it's a really good question are the reflection questions that utilize to lead the community from thought to thought to the realization they have expertise and knowledge part of that happens with the asset mapping process if community folks are engaged in it um real quick the way i usually do this with communities is we we gather folks um so that's a process in and of itself but once we have 30 or 40 folks in a church basement and a community hall um, i put up the six asset categories as stations around the room i divide the room by six into six groups um, i do a short definition of the assets and then i have people write on the flip chart at their station um all the assets in that community that meet that category. Um, so if they're at the association station, they just start writing the associations that are in the community. After five minutes, I have them rotate. The association groups goes to institutions. The institution groups goes to physical assets, around like that. Um, and then they add to the list of the group that went before them. 
then I kind of reduce it to about three minutes because people are adding to lists versus generating them. But in about 20 minutes, you can have a large group of that generate a huge chunk of the committee's assets. And then I have them read back um, what what's on their list because the association people now have gone around to all in five different times, other people have added to their original list. So they read it off to the whole group. I've never done this without the first reaction from people being, I've never felt better about living in my community because they see it, not for all that's in the newspaper, not for all the needs assessments that ask them about what's wrong with them or what's shitty about their community, but for what, what they have and what they have to offer and, and what they can love about their community. That's a huge process um, right in and of itself. And then I ask them, you know, where do you see yourself connecting with these assets um, in ways that can create the change you want for your community? And people start throwing out ideas. And then we have people just say, who wants to work on James's idea over there? Because some folks might not have an idea of one thing they want to do, but they heard his and they want to work on it. Um, that's a process. I've also done it with individuals where we do hands, head, heart. What do you know a lot about? What are you good at doing? What do you care about? Each person gets a half sheet flip chart. They write that, put them all over the walls. And then we have people do a gallery walk and see what other people's gifts are. And then I ask the same thing with the people in this room, with just our gifts, what could we do to make this community more the community we want it to be? And that's just a huge recognition. Um, and, and people run with that. Um, I, and I've seen whole communities change. And one community I worked in, the, the violent crime rate went down 50% a year for three years after that exercise. And the and community members started engaging in projects based on just a multi-purpose room at a school and an hour of looking at each other's gifts and, and the projects that came out of that. And, and at the same time, sometimes it can be hard for... It, like if you do that for yourself, the gifts inventory or the um, gifts of the head, heart, hand, um, and write out your own gifts and assets. Sometimes it's really hard to identify and see your own gifts. Mm -hmm. uh, doing it is an is a way to to see how difficult that is and understand that it's difficult for other people too. Um, but part of the job is in those learning conversations and in the gifts inventories and all of these things. These are tools that you can use. But part of the job is to be listening really, really intently for what the gifts are, even if they don't name it as a gift. And then remembering that, storing it away, to putting it in a list, however you hold on to it, um, you can use that information to go back and ask them to use their gifts or to pay them even better, pay them to use their gifts. Mm -hmm. um, so an example, I, I was at setting up for a community meeting. I was hosting at a recreation or community center. And there was a young man there who was there early and asked what we were doing. Um, he was playing basketball and I invited him to stay um, to learn about the developments that were gonna happen in this community um, and, and the ways that we were trying to engage folks um, to make sure it happened in a way that benefited them. And um, and he, he shared a little bit about himself. He, I asked him what, what he likes to do, what he's interested in. And he said that, um, that he is a rapper and a poet. So I stored that away in my head. And when, and he stayed at the community meeting, we started to engage with him over a few months. And when um, the group decided that they wanted to create a community creed, um, that, mm. that that was one of the first steps they wanted to take was to say um, what this place means to them and who they are collectively. In this space, we treat each other this way. In this space, we come together often to do these things. In this place, we believe in X, Y, and Z, we value these things. He was the first person that popped into my mind as someone who, who should be enlisted to help write that creed. Um, and so helping, helping people see their own gifts and then inviting them to use them is really, really critical for, for the work too. And um, it's kind of like a fast track to, um, to, to positive change. You're getting some love uh, for that story and to go, um, myself included, what a lovely concept and way to go about it. Um, we have another question still open in Q&A. Um, we do have a little bit more time, but I also wanted to know for those um, folks from organizations and institutions or government in particular who are sticking with us, um, it's occurred to me that 
I'm about to present at an, uh, a conference that's hosted by the American Hospital Association, um, which can be a somewhat tough uh, you know, sector <laughs> to get to think about authentic community relationships and how to really partner with uh, their the community that they're in and that they should, you know, kind of recognize that they're part of. And I'm just, I'd love to hear any reflections from folks on who are, you know, still with us. What, what did bring you here? Clearly you're very, uh, you know, um, engaged with and interested in this approach uh, and, and believe in the power of that. And what, what brought you there? I mean, if it could just be part of the way you were raised and the, the air you breathe, but if, if you had any aha moments or um, insights into a, a story or example that might be powerful for others who are still thinking like, I have to do this needs assessment and like three focus groups and I'm done in six weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's different from, you know, like really investing in the um, power and potential of, of this approach. So if anyone has any thoughts they'd like to pop in the chat, I will, um, I would appreciate it. And uh, I will uh, share out later as suggested for some of these chats that were meant to be more for the, um, for everyone. So um, the the last question that we do have um, in the Q&A uh, is thinking it, it, the, it's, it reads very public healthy. So I'll also I'll read it and <laughs> do my interpretation of it. Best practices for validating identified assets and or how to be aware of pre-existing asset maps to avoid duplication. Um, so I I do wonder about that whole concept of validating assets. And, and that to me is the more um, interesting part of the question. Like, do you, does that resonate? Does do, do assets need to be validated or does the process like uh, just kind of reveal what's there that you, and then the next step sort of figure out how to leverage them? Yeah. Well, I'll let somebody else go. No, go ahead. Yeah. Go. Um, yeah. My my main thought was that um, asset maps are never complete. They're they're living documents that can be added on and modified. They change. Communities change. People pass away. Associations dissolve. Um, things change, and so um, and and who's living in a community sometimes changes. Um, who considers what an asset. Um, you might be introduced to new groups. Anyways, my point is um, it's important to, to start one or to build off of one that already exists um, and to continue to shape it. And that's why I like to use uh, Google My Maps because it's easy to adapt and shift and change. Um, whereas um, paper ones are more difficult, but, um, but that, that was my vision. I think also it's important to recognize that um, the value of the asset map is, is as a guide to relationship building. Mm -hmm. uh, as content in and of itself, it's not that valuable. As content which is shared with community and discussed and engaged with, it's valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and so <clears throat> even if somebody's done an asset map in an area, there's, there's value in engaging in the activity. And if they're still around and if their asset map is written down somewhere or on a Google My Map or on flip charts, you know, starting there is great. Um, but as Indigo said, communities are organic, so they're always changing. But also asset maps aren't aren't um, static data. They're, they're meant to guide what you do next um, and not just what you collect. Yeah, because that question, what can we do with what we have? is an ongoing mm -hmm. question that's asked in community. Um, and I would just say, um, you know, I fully agree with the asset map part of that question, but like validate and identify gifts. Indigo spoke to it. Um, recognizing, um, paying folks, uh, so, you know, making sure that these dollars get as close as possible into the hands of people. <laughs> Um, I, you know, and also finding ways to celebrate people's people's gifts um, and the different aspects there. So th this is where um, we get to, you know, this this asset of joy, you know, this culture. Like we get to be a part of that. 
um, within these communities, right? So the things that the community celebrates, um, that's something that we get to lean into and benefit from as well. So, um, and just in addition to that, like when, you know, in, in some of our ABCD trainings, we talk about the unintended consequences or sometimes intended, the consequences of only focusing on needs is that people begin to believe that they are deficient or the community is deficient. Mm -hmm. So just like if you've only done this type of work from a needs-based approach, there's mm -hmm. some unlearning and relearning that you have to do. There's also some unlearning that community has to do as well. Like if for, you know, they, a person's whole lifetime, they've just thought, oh, I'm just a recipient of social services and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our salvation comes from, you know, <laughs> some other organization. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some time for folks to really recognize that, oh, I do have a gift, right? So it's creating that space for them to be discovered and celebrated. I'll never forget a couple of years ago, I had, like I started working with, with youth in the neighborhood. They will go out, discover gifts, and then they will come home, come to my house. Because at the time it was all in my house which wasn't the best idea, but it's what we had at the time. <laughs> so we had like 25 kids in my home, but on big post-its, you know, the kind of the gallery deal, you know, like Run talked about, but they would write them out. So my whole dining room was decorated with the gifts of neighbors that were discovered. So when people came to my house, they're like, what's all this? I'm like, oh, this is such and such gift. You know, so it would just blow people's minds um, in our neighborhood. That's for the most part, people only focus on what's wrong. Mm -hmm. see like oh well there's actually some gifts here you know so it mm -hmm. does something for folks who see it and also does something for people who are able to that's drawn out of them something that's been laying dormant for so long so um, there's any other question maybe that was the last question there's a big one in the chat <laughs> i understand it fully um it would be helpful to know um, who in communities were saying that having a more consolidated list would be beneficial and and beneficial for what? I don't know if you can, if it's Alexandra able to come off mute and expand on that observation. Hello. There you are. Hi, I apologize for all the, the comments, but this conversation is just super exciting to me. Um, I guess I can share. So I work for United Way of Greater Houston, and um, we typically focus on community. When, when we talked about the needs-based assessments and, and some of that work, that, um, and we uh, particularly provide services for that immediate assist assistance or crisis space, but a particular project that I'm working on is really uh, leaning towards some of that self-sufficiency and recognizing the strengths and the the attributes that communities do have and how do we lift that up. And so as we're going into different communities, we're hearing a lot about kind of that decision fatigue or there, you know, when they do identify um, some of the strengths in their communities, it can feel really overwhelming of like, I don't even know where to start. And so I was the one that asked the, the anonymous question in the chat in regards to how to validate the different assets. And that, maybe that was a wrong use of words, but I guess it really just stems from the members that we've spoke to kind of how, how do we know which assets are the ones that should really lie on the map um going back to are that you point about of, united way member agencies no no, no. so the, oh. so we are actually taking a, a little bit more, this particular united way we're going into community and so we're working mm -hmm. a lot with our different regions um we have a community voice uh, leadership council they are getting uh, stipends mm -hmm. and being compensated for that as well and so we're kind of in the development phase of this whole asset map and and hearing from the community from that that point of um view yeah i i think i understand what you're saying um in terms of are you talking about once you've identified a mm -hmm. bunch of assets a bunch of ideas a bunch of gifts a bunch of resources how do you narrow down on what to do with them, yes. what to do first? Mm -hmm. And those four questions are really a helpful tool um, to help you parse out, um, one, what's the short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals? Um, but even before that, um, what, what you can do by yourself, what you can do with a little help, what you need outside help for, um, 
and, and you typically those things also correlate with what can you do immediately right now? What can you do a little bit down the line in a year or two with some work and collaboration and what's going to be a longer process, like a five-year initiative? Um, gotcha. Understood. Thank you. And and it might even be um, like what what are folks already doing? Yeah. You know, so because hopefully they're in the room because they're up to something, right? Mm -hmm. They have some care about community and are involved in some way. So then, you know, as United Way, you can help um, you know, breathe some more life into that. Um, kind of multiply that effort but I'm I'll be I'll be curious what those folks are already involved in mm -hmm. um, so that they don't feel because I I can understand like if you got a lot going on in your life and then you get this opportunity but the the ask is to start something else on top of all this you know like mm -hmm. that may feel overwhelming mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if um for various reasons, they may want to may not want to come out and say that. <laughs> it's like I'm, I got too much. But here's this thing. Here's this passion project I have over here that we haven't even talked about. Mm -hmm. I think also we in Western culture, especially, we have this tendency to want to be comprehensive and say, okay, let's let's gather everything. That's not that valuable. Um, there's nothing wrong with low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Once you have some low hanging fruit, grab it, eat it, enjoy it then figure out what's next um this is there's no value and in fact there's it can be harmful to spend too much time gathering and mapping and listing versus once you've got some energy around something running with it thank you thank you for the question yeah thank you alexandra on that note, we are at uh, at time, so I think we're ready to close out. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending, and uh, we will get the slides and the um, recording out. It will be on the Dash website. I've included a couple of links in the chat um, with that information. And a big thank you to our AVCD faculty. Thank you so much for um, sharing your knowledge and expertise and wisdom with all of us is very valuable. Um, and yeah, looking forward to seeing everyone at our upcoming webinars. We are planning three at this point. So we would love to get your feedback um, about what kind of topics you would like to see, what questions you have. Um, we are also planning those coaching sessions. So really want to do more of a peer learning format around that. And please fill out the post survey um, and it'll help us make um, make sure that everything is valuable to you and your organization. So yeah, thanks everyone. And looking forward to speaking with you in the future. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.